minutes of the last meeting. Um, is the committee have happy to confirm the minutes of the last meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Any apologies for absence, uh, Emma? Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Simon Thornton, Paul um, Buckton, and um, Sam Richard, and substitutes are British Relis and Captain Louise. Oh, very welcome. You, you were substitute last time, so <laughs> that's very helpful. Okay, any declaration of interest? No, no. Any questions from members of the public? Uh, none received. None received, okay. Now, the, the first uh, full item is, is um, the, the review of health and inequalities in the borough. And Alex is going to take us through a scoping document that has already been circulated. So we'll briefly introduce it and then anyone can ask any questions they wish to. And then we're going to have a presentation from Karen from Surrey County Council. So over to you, Alex. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so what I'll do, I'll kind, of, I'll kind of guide you through the scope. I'll, I assume that you've all read, read the scope, so I won't go too much into detail. But I'll just give a quick overview, and then I'll hand it over to Karen to kind of guide you through um, the District Council's contribution to public health, which is kind of like a, um, a preamble to this review. So what started this review was data coming from Public Health England, which showed that there was a life expectancy gap of about 11 or about 12 years for women and eight years for men from the most deprived wars compared to the least deprived. And this got myself, Andy and Liz, thinking about what is it that a district council and a borough council can do to reduce this kind of health inequality. And then I got in touch with Karen, and she introduced us to the idea of um, determinants of health. And really, what we kind of realised is that our health is primarily determined by other factors other than our healthcare. So, for example, this might be socio-economic factors, environmental factors, and lifestyle behaviours. So, for example, for socio-economic determinants, we may be looking at the place where we live and work, um, the, our housing conditions, how planning affects the nature of our borough, how, how we can access our services. Um, from lifestyle behaviours, we can look at things such as smoking, um, diet, levels of physical activity, alcohol and drug use. And another important factor is actually having access to healthcare services, or should I say lack of access in some cases, where it may actually result in unmet needs being met and actually produce sort of some unwanted hospitalisations that could have been prevented. So the data that I've quoted in the scoping document should be read um, both with caution but also with interest, because on a whole, health and well-being in Waverley is generally very good and Waverley is a very prosperous and desirable place to live, and that should be read all in context. But there are a handful of areas within Waverley, and compared to Surrey as a whole, that do highlight where this life expectancy gap may be shown. And I've quoted it in the scoping document, but just for your attention, these areas in Waverley, for example, are Alfred, Cranley, Rural and Ellen's Green, Farnham, Upper Hale, Godalming Central and Oxford, God Godalming Biscombe, <laughs> Farnham Castle and Farnham Moor Park. Um, now there is no one unifying reason why all of these wards feature, but the main point is that they do feature, and this is quoted by the JSNA data and Surrey Eye, so it's all backed up with evidence. So the task of this review is to kind of look at why, the, why is life expectancy such a big issue in this borough when Surrey is one of the most affluent places to live in Britain. So that's kind of our key line of inquiry, and I'll like to hand over to Karen who will kind of explain a little bit more about the district and borough council's role in tackling this health inequality. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for asking me to come along tonight. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview in terms of the key role that district and boroughs have really in terms of addressing health inequalities. What I want to say is, and, and Alex touched on this, is it is quite right in the whole of England we do very well here in Surrey and that shouldn't be forgotten. But I think that being poor in somewhere like Surrey is sometimes more of a challenge than living in more urban or northern or um, inner cities around the rest of the country. Because in Surrey, they are largely hidden. They live too, you know, cheek and jowl next to quite affluent areas. And that means it's quite difficult to target work on scale in somewhere like the county. So I think that we 
have a unique challenge here. Well, before, so we'll go on to that, but that's why I say we just need to be mindful that it's um, it's not the same as addressing inequalities in somewhere like Manchester, Liverpool, London. We are going to have to be more innovative in how we tackle it here because it's not going to be as straightforward as those areas because we don't have the population size, the scale that they have in localised areas. We could be looking at a much more disparate issue. And the other thing I was going to say was we are likely not to have one issue that is what the problem is. is. It's likely to be highly complex <coughs> and multifactorial. So one size won't fit all. So we're going to have to be quite clever in how we tackle it. But I wanted to say I'm a really big champion of boroughs and districts. Always have been. I've worked in the county for quite some time now. And by and large, um, I'm one of your greatest fans because working in a two-tier county as opposed to other areas, it's quite a challenge. But I think that you have a very unique relationship because you have a very intimate relationship with residents, which Surrey, at a county level, can't replicate at all. So bear that in mind as we go through this, because this will show you the evidence why that statement, I believe, is true. So, um, as um, Alex said, health issues by and large, everyone tends to think of GPs, hospitals as the main health providers and they're there to sort it all out. But actually, our health is affected more by other factors outside of healthcare. Um, I've jumped up a bit, so I've just, that's what I've just been saying about um, how valued you are, but this is what I was saying. So this graph, these um, tables here show that other factors have a much bigger bearing on one's health than, than you, know, acts, you know, GPs and so on, hospitals. So here, so this is over the last sort of 20 years bits of research and there's further research as well. It shows that some of our health is affected by genetics. So some people say when they're overweight, runs in the family. But actually, it's very, very few that can actually say they're have excess weight, they're overweight because of their genetic disposition. It's by and large because of their lifestyle. Um, so, so you can see there, so they thought it was about 40% and then the other factors were 57%. By um, 2012, there was much more detailed synopsis of that. So you can see healthcare had been squashed down to just 25% of the impact it has and everything else 50% socioeconomic, 15% environmental. So the wider environment has a much bigger role to play on people's health. And you'll, and then going on to the next slide, and, and so um, councils themselves, your relationship, this is across the whole of England, you have a, a much bigger um, focus than people led to believe. Everything tends to go up a tier, the money goes up a tier, but actually you're dealing with a huge number of people, 22 million people. Um, you play a key role in keeping us healthy, and so going back to that, the pie charts, often the services and um, areas within which you work touch on those elements, those certain economic principles, so things like housing, leisure, um, economic development, planning, environmental services, they're all services that you have either a direct responsible for or very key in influencing. Housing, for example, it's been shown to cost the NHS over two billion every year. Um, and what research has shown that by improving homes, it actually has a positive effect, a return on um, investment. Um, you have a, a direct role in house building, in homelessness prevention. We've just done a health needs assessment um, on the homeless population in Surrey. Um, and enforcement powers to improve the condition of the private rented sector. I touched on obesity. We live in an increasingly obesogenic environment. It's geared, it's built, it's engineered, so we are bound to put weight on. 
and we've got to look at ways, and this doesn't have cost implications. Quite a lot of the measures that I hope that we'll be able to consider are free. It's about the way in which we refine policy, and it's how we nudge people along to make better lifestyle choices. And you can do that by, you know, the work that you do in commissioning the leisure services, you've got some excellent ones here in Waverley. Um, access to all quality green spaces, well, we're blessed, aren't we? Um, and they are important to mental health as well as physical health. Um, air pollution, that is an issue here for Waverley. We have some problem hotspot areas, and that does impact on people's um, physical health. Um, foodborne diseases, you're responsible for environmental health, um, and they cause in the country around 20,000 hospital episodes a year. We track that um, in terms of, we get the data through in terms of outbreaks and so on. But, it, but we get the data, you actually deliver the services to try and counter those. Um, you so it's, it's not just pollution, food safety inspections, pest control, emergency planning. Um, the economy, in terms of how um, we look to raise, um, by and large, there is low unemployment here in the county. But where it does exist, a lot of it has, it may be a question of access. If you live somewhere rural, getting a job means that you have to learn to drive, that has cost implications. If you have to catch a train, well, we all know the prices for every new year. It's becoming increasingly difficult for people to be mobile in the county. So that will have a knock on effect. But we have a district council, I'm saying we, I'm including me in this, um, we have a role in pulling businesses into the area to make it more available for people, for local people to get local jobs. So that's economic development. Um, town council, uh, district council planners, they're key players in encouraging active uh, commuting. Um, there's a real, there's a lot of research, it's very current at the moment, around place, about building and designing, very uh, focused ways in which uh, we build in healthy lifestyles, we build in healthy communities, and that's, you know, you, you need to be championing that. Affordable housing, so fantastic place has been built here in Godalming itself. Um, so we're saying about well-connected communities. This is what's termed social capital. That's a bit of you know, jargon that's around. But actually, what it really means is communities talking to one another, being there for one another, supporting one another. Families, the wider neighbours, um, community groups. If you've got a very good infrastructure that supports people, then you improve people's physical as well as their mental well-being. Social isolation is a really big issue. Um, there's data to show that we collect where people don't know their, their neighbours. And, you know, that's tragic today, really. So you know, that's not a cost implication. That's about getting people to connect more. Uh, districts have a really close relationship with their communities, like I said at the beginning, but you have that link with parish councils, town councils, which are quite <coughs> disengaged from a, at a county level. You have a that much better understanding of your geographical and your residential footprint. So this paper, this presentation that I've um, plagiarised and made my own, um, was produced by the King's Fund, which is a think tank. It does some remarkable work around health and social care research. So they put this together. They put it together around about the time of the Health and Social Care Act, when everything was thrown up into the air and we're still waiting for all the bits of confetti to come down. And it was meant to show you that you have a vital role in the whole aspect of public health and reducing health inequalities. Because by and large, when that act came into force, everything went to a unitary and upper tier level. And I think that you felt a bit lost in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was done by people like myself to show, actually, we have always recognised you. We've always worked with you. But it was done to almost educate a system, really, as to the vital role that district and boroughs have to play. 
I've got three points to end on. So I've outlined how you have that unique, intimate position. It's really important that we're doing this piece of work because we are at a time of, um, of change. There's huge change going on in health still, with a formation, as you know, the Health and Social Care Act fiddled about, created um, a much more complicated system than we were led to believe we were ever going to get. The creation of the CCGs, we now have the creation of something called sustainability and transformation programmes. In Surrey, we don't do things easily, we've got three. So this is timely, of looking at your place, at your position of influence in this changing landscape. Also, we're in a state of change as the policy measures around austerity are really starting to bite for individuals, which could make what we're looking at even more important. Because as you may have seen over the last week or so, there's been some national research looking at life expectancy as a, for the country as a whole, a stalled. And we're the only one in Europe where that's happened. And as you know, there are other countries facing austerity around the world, around Europe, but it's only as that's stalled. And then finally, you can't do this on your own. No one's saying that you will have the blueprint with a panacea that will cure this. You can't do it on your own. You have to do it in partnership. The outcome, the recommendations, you will be able to identify your role, but I think you'll also be able to identify the role that you would like other agencies to do for you. So as so it's a leadership role that I see where you will be recommending to other partners how they can work with you in trying to reduce, which actually is quite shameful, this 10-year age discre discrepancy. So what that means is that women who live in an affluent area are living 10 years longer than a woman living in a poorer area. And for somewhere like Surrey, that shouldn't be happening. You can get anomalies. If there's a large concentration of nursing homes, they can skew the results. So we might be that might account for maybe four or five years, but I don't know what's accounting for the 10 years. So I think it's a really good opportunity for us to have a look and see what we can do to try and reduce that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. Any questions for Carmen? Yes, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, not so much a question, certainly at this stage, but um, Karen, thank you very much for, for a very clear and lucidly presented um, presentation, which I thank you. Um, and uh, that's been uh, most helpful because we have in front of us quite a significant piece of work. There's certainly lots of words, and um, you also mentioned jargon. Interestingly, you also sort of explain what the particular jargon was. Now, I think for uh, councillors, certainly for somebody like me anyway, uh, we do need to have things in plain English and as uh, simply put as possible. So, um, in sort of uh, fighting my way through all this, there are um, <coughs> a number of things for me just to uh, emphasise from my particular perspective, and that is um, the aspect of um, access to good quality housing. I've been developing quite a worry really over the, uh, the time I've been a councillor and on the planning committee um, because we see that over the decades, these last decades, we've had uh, housing becoming more and more compressed. Uh, we've had rooms themselves becoming smaller generally and I'm concerned that um, if developers through the planning process are allowed to continue in that way. We're not going to improve the situation at all. And we really need to try hard to um, bring a halt to all that um, bad environment that the built environment provides for, for people. Um, I mean, the government isn't helping in the sense that uh, a lot of infill has been um, allowed and of course, when the US states were put together in the past, um, it was done under um, you know, good design principles. 
and therefore there were spaces you now suddenly were allowed to sort of fill in those spaces. And I don't think that's a good thing that cuts right across the particular discipline that was uh, applied. There's one thing come to hand that I've spoken to a head of planning about, and that is this aspect of the uh, space guidelines. And um, I'm very conscious, you know, the bedroom sizes, for example, they're quoted. Quoted as um, minimum size. I prefer to think of it should not be <coughs> less than. Should not be less than. And if we declare, uh, have a declared three bedroom place, and the third uh, bedroom falls below those guidelines, I think we've got to challenge, be in a position to challenge the designers, the architect, because if an architect will consult, he should be able to sort of design the third bedroom, you know, to give that minimum sizing. And I'd like to think that we can perhaps introduce other things in the planning process that give really strong guidelines that we can enforce and say, look, sunshine, enough's enough. You've gone beyond what's, what's reasonable and allowed. Yeah. So um, that's just uh, my, my <coughs> feelings uh, about it. In the comments, I, I, I think you, yeah, I think the challenge is is working within within the parameters of what the law will allow us to say and do. But I think that's where we create a culture of, so if, so if Waverley wants to have this under a, a heading of, of, you know, all of our services take into consideration the health and well-being of our residents in everything we do, you can, you can slide and introduce measures like you've outlined into planning. When we have our, so with a local plan, so that tackle Dunsfold and so on. I thought that was quite a very well written document. I thought it touched on quite a lot of it. It did consider quite a lot of health implications. The challenge will be holding firm and making sure that those that were outlined come to fruition. And I think that's where, that's the, that's the wriggle room. And I think that if we brand and we build a comprehensive service, because if you remember saying, I don't think it'll be one solution, I think it'll be multifactorial. Mm -hmm. If we position, this is what we do in Waverley, this is what we expect, we engage the community in knowing and understanding that, we engage with local architects and say, this is what we expect. It's winning a public relations battle. We might not ho always have the legal ramifications to support us, but at least we're putting out our stall and saying this is what we expect. We don't expect anything less for our residents. And then, you know, we're all on the same side in championing things. So I think that's how we do it. My worry is where they will, will work to the letter of the law and then escalate it to a, a legal challenge, which we've had in a number over the years here in Waverley. But I think we, there's lots of measures, which are called nudge measures, that are free, that we introduce and we do it comprehensively. And I think we just lay out our stall. So part of planning, I, I don't to like step on anyone's toes, but you know, part of it is is engaging, saying this is where we are now going forward. And you can fall back on this evidence, because that's what's really good about um, having the comprehensive data. You don't need to worry about that, but it can underpin the policies that you're putting in force saying we're doing this because the evidence shows us it will lead to these positive health outcomes for our residents. And we are on a mission because we are determined to reduce this gap, this, this inequality in our borough. Mm. Thank you, Chairman. I think Damon's got some comments. As well. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Uh, may maybe um, if I could start by um, just saying how impressed I was with the presentation. That was the best presentation that I've mm. heard about the role that the district council, can, the role that we can contribute towards public health or health outcomes of our communities, really, really compelling. And it's an area that we certainly take very seriously as officers, but I think you brought it to life. Mm. In terms of housing, I think um, we're very lucky in Waverley because not only do we have the planning functions that informs where the houses goes and the numbers, but we also have the opportunity to develop our own council housing. And we have a very successful house building program. And interestingly, the Housing Overview and Scrutiny Committee have decided to do an in-depth review on the guidelines 
about what they call design guidelines on issues like that. So the space, the size of the rooms, storage facilities, how the rooms are used. Because at a basic level, if we want to have housing that protects people's health and enables them to be healthy, it needs to be dry, it needs to not be damp, it needs to not be overcrowded, it needs to um, uh, enable people to live their lives. So for our council homes, our tenants are saying, we want kitchen diners where we can cook and supervise our children and them doing their homework because that kind of works better for us. And they want to feel safe. They want to feel safe in their home, but they want to feel safe when they're walking down the streets, which could be to access a job, which is great for one's health. Really, one of the best ways to improve someone's physical and mental health is give them employment. And Kelvin's team runs Waverley Training Services, which is a fantastic, which most councils don't have, is designed specifically to help develop work-based skills, particularly for young people leaving school, leaving college, that might otherwise be unemployed. And we're supporting them in those ways. And so one of the things I think to share with members is that in lots of different ways, Waverley does more than most in areas that could impact really positively on health outcomes. Mm -hmm. We may have not seen it in that way before. We fund the voluntary sector almost a million pounds a year. This committee that we'll be looking <coughs> later at the meal service, community meal service, the day centres or the community centres. There are lots of ways that, some by accident, some by design, that we have an opportunity to make a really positive impact on the health outcomes of our community. Mm -hmm. And that 10 year or 11 year gap in life expectancy, <coughs> I've worked in London most of my career, that's the kind of gap that you'd expect in a London, in a London area or a city where you've got huge affluence <coughs> against huge levels of mm. deprivation and poverty, you would not expect it in a place like Surrey. Mm. And so it is, it is an astonishing, astonishing problem for a borough that's generally pretty successful and wealthy. Mm. And it's definitely w a worthwhile target for the council and its groups to look at how we can, can tackle it. Picking up on the first comment, Damon, do you think it would be worthwhile to take this presentation to the executives? I think I think you really I think it's it very good be very good timing. If you want to spread awareness throughout the whole council, that would be the, the place to start. Then. And, and I, I get the sense that there's a growing interest in what's called place shaping. Mm. So how the council not just delivers great services, but how we influence the outcomes, mm. the wider outcomes for our communities. Mm. And health outcomes are a very important part of it. So I think I think it would be. Would, would you be willing to do that, Cam, if it can be organised? Yeah, very happy. To. I'm not sure quite sure who organises that actually. You could perhaps advise between us. Yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah. so we'll leave it to democratic services yeah. to work out how that should happen. Okay, any, any other questions for Ken? Thank you for letting me speak. I'm not sure where I was going to get to scout the point. Um, Damien's mentioned the um, quality of the um, presentation. I've had the privilege of working with Karen, mm. so I'm not surprised. <laughs> and Karen works with a team of very very good people, so mm. I'm not surprised, and I'm delighted to have heard it tonight. Some of what Damien said, I was going to say about the about the executive, because almost, I think the words that were said was um, it should be the golden thread. Well, health mm. and well-being should be the golden thread of everything we do, because we are there to represent the communities and do the best we can. Mm. So I think that's a really good phrase. The golden thread of what we do should include this. And Damon mentioned place shaping, and we, you know, we, all afternoon we've been talking about that and, and our st strategic direction. I suppose my challenge, if you can call it a challenge, is there's a lot of work, as Dennis has said, and I've quickly looked through some of your papers, mm. is taking that and that actually making sure what decisions we make as an executive that actually does consider these issues. And that's going to be quite challenging to make sure that we can take your work mm. and have something to influence our decisions. Mm. So I think it's a nice challenge. So I think it's one that we're certainly up for and play shaping, as Damon has mentioned. I mm. think this is a real opportunity. But we have to do it in a way that we can take your findings and say, OK, we've got to make a decision about that. Mm. Have we considered what the health and wellbeing? Because sometimes you don't always consider all the different aspects of the issues that affect us. Yeah. So, absolutely delighted, and, and I'll, I'll listen to it again when it comes to the executive. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it would be good to let people know what it's about. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to say something, Trisha? Yes. 
I don't wish to be negative. Thank you for an excellent report, which I did actually copy off because I received it by email. I'm just concerned. We have the very best of intentions. We achieve a huge amount in Waverley in this area, but we're so dependent on other outside bodies. People like the county council with regard to schools and CCGs. CCGs, as far as I'm aware, have not ever responded to one approach in the consultation process mm. for large-scale planning applications. And I think it's really important that they could do that. Mm. So my concern is we have to work with all of these other bodies who sometimes, I'm sorry, I don't think they take much notice of this. And I would <laughs> like to know how, <laughs> how we actually get through to these people. Um, so I couldn't possibly comment. No. Um, <laughs> I so, didn't so wish so to be offended. So, no, no, no. So, so maybe I remove myself as um, an employee now and then become a resident here now. Um, and one of the ways... So in CCG's defence, because I share your anxiety there, but in their defence, they were brand new when they were set up five years ago. So they have taken time to establish themselves as organisations. They had to hit the ground running um, because they had some serious work to do and they were very much focused on their core role and remit, but it took them a while to find their feet. They're finding their feet and now a new, there's a new guy in town <coughs> called the Sustainability and Transformation Programme. So they're still, it's still tricky in health. But the way in which you can do it, so for example, on Thursday, I think it's either this week or next week, they have their AGM, and it's here in Godalming. I go, mean, when is it, Alex? Because I've got to go to it. When is it? Because I, I said, <laughs> so, it's, um, so it's either this Thursday or next Thursday, it's next Thursday, next Thursday. Mm-hmm. three till six o'clock. It's a public meeting, and just a few of your, you guys, if you've got time to spend, as you just raise questions, in any other business. Now, I couldn't possibly have suggested that, but that might be one of the ways in which you say, we really want to work collaboratively with you, but we do feel it's a bit one-sided at the moment. Mm. And then they've got to go away and address that, haven't they? They have. I don't wish to be parochial, but I'm from Cranley, and two consultations recently, one with the 101 service and out of our service, yes. and previously the stroke service. Yes. They never managed to get to Cranley. They did for the second one with the 101 service, but I have to say, because a councillor from Hazelmere very kindly let me know about it, I was the only person who turned up. That's outrageous. Mm. We make a complaint. Yes, we'll arrange something, but nothing ever happens. But but I I think that part of this piece of work is looking at ways in which we can be assured that we do have that involved because we can't do it on our own. It has to be a, a collegiate approach to it, um, and they, ha- you know, th- that could come out as part of this scope that we feel that some of our messages aren't getting through, and then we work. But it, it, it's there were reasons at the beginning, and but I think we, you know, there is a. There's definitely the need for much more closer collaboration, for sure. Thank you. Okay, I suspect we could spend a whole hour or okay. more on this, but we have got quite a big agenda to go through, so I think we need to move on. Uh, just the comment that we now have the members of the task group established. You'll have seen that in your paper. And Alex is setting up the first meeting of the task group in the next uh, week or so. I think there's a couple of alternative dates that have been circulated. So Karen can tell how you have availability on those dates. Okay. So I think it would be good to get that in the open now to try and get something in the time. Yeah. But thanks a lot, Karen. That was really, really yeah, helpful. Right. Sorry, Jim, Kevin. If I, if I could just want make perhaps one sort of recommendation for, the, for your first meeting. Um, we did some work with the King, King's Fund yes. on how to um, deal with sort of the care within Waverley. But as part of that, we did a sort of wider role where we... Um, collated a, a film called Waverley Cares that it's only 
10 minutes. Ten minutes yeah. I would suggest, if, if you could, that perhaps that could be played at the start of your first, yeah. so you could watch it, because I think it emphasises the role, as you rightly say, Karen, that we have to play, and the role we are currently playing. It summarises some of the good work that's going on, and it might be useful yeah. to set the scene for you at the first meeting. That's a very good yeah. idea, so yeah. let's do that then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome to take hand, but you've probably got other important things to do. Dinner for the kids tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's very important. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank we, we did actually, in, in a sense, endorse a, a first meeting, but you've now had the full publication from Alex, so <coughs> I'll be all agree that we endorse the, the score that Alex has circulated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next so, item Jim, I think is... So, often in the past, um, the sort of recommendation is, oh, the committee notes this. For me, that's not a very strong statement at all, and could even suggest, well, well yes, we passed it through, and that's okay. I'd like some stronger words for you. I think we're saying that it has been really considered. I, th I think we're saying the committee endorses, in fact. Is that, is that the term we're using? Yeah, and there'll be a detailed minute yeah. of what's been said. That is a stronger. Yes, there'll be a detailed minute. But not just noting, we've asked the members to endorse what Alex has written to us. And mm. But it has um, been subject to examination. You know, yes, yes. It has not gone over it. But good, good point, then. Good point. Okay, I think we're now due a presentation from, is it Nora, on, on the... Yes, me. <laughs> on the Fund <laughs> Management Report. At the previous meeting of this committee, it was agreed that going forward performance indicators would be reported on exception basis only. Therefore, this report will only concentrate in the future on those KPIs where performance is above or below the target by more than 5%, and where those indicators without a target are not good. As requested, the graphic trend analysis report was preserved in the same form and is set out at Annex 1 on the page 35 of this agenda. The first quarter has seen a very strong performance with only one amber indicator. And also at the previous meeting, the committee has uh, discussed the possibility of including an additional set of performance indicators allowing a broader view of the service performance. The officers have consulted the service managers and the head of service and a list of possible indicators was prepared. And here are the options we would like the committee to consider. For the service area of Caroline, three possible indicators have been identified. Firstly, the total number of clients, which in the past couple of years remained at a steady level of around 1,800 clients at any given time. Secondly, the number of calls per quarter. And finally, an indicator for the critical fault dealt, dealt with within 48 hours for which 95% quarterly target is recommended. For the service area of Waverly Training Services, also three possible indicators have been identified. Firstly, the overall apprentice success rate at 80% quarterly target recommended, and also the apprentice timely success rate, measuring achievement of qualification in the expected time scale with the recommended quarterly target of 75%. Finally, the number of apprentices on study programs with a yearly target of 30 apprentices, which breaks down to seven and a half apprentices per quarter. There's also one indicator which could be added to the leisure service area, monitoring the number attending weight management or other well-being classes and activities. We welcome any thoughts and recommendations from the committee. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I might ask about the amber result, please, um, in, in the, the Farnham Leisure Centre. Uh, we obviously did remarkably well at, around the Christmas area. Um, it, it looked as though we were only just a little bit down in the first quarter, presumably that's January to March. I've heard there is a, a new leisure centre in Farnham. Do we know whether people are finding their way back to us now, or have any? Do we have any update on figures, please, Kelvin? Perhaps. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, certainly evidence suggests that we are having um, members return from the new sort of private gym that opened up very close by. Um, somewhat, some of these figures are sometimes somewhat seasonal. Um, I think it's, you know, it's still within sort of the parameters of a, of a good performance, so that we're within 5%. So although it's amber and it's the only one that stands out, they are still our sort of second highest use leisure centre in, in our sort of portfolio. So they're doing extremely well. They hit, they are now seeing the returning customers, okay. yes. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? In which case, can I come back again, Mr. Yes, Chairman? Do. May I say how pleased I am that we are thinking of looking at the Apprentice uh, yes. program. I, I think this is really extremely important and the more we encourage young people to be themselves and not to expect to be automatically put on the uh, treadmill on the way to university when perhaps it doesn't mm -hmm. suit them at all nor the public at the end of it um, I think this is very much to be recommended and thank you very much mm -hmm. I've got one question myself Kevin, which came out of a pre-meeting do, do we collect any information on whether or not GPs refer to, to the leisure centres, uh, the, the, the patients and so on. Is that something we know about or not? Abs absolutely, Chairman. So where um, Nora's alluded to sort of numbers attending weight management and wellbeing activities, mm -hmm. um, wellbeing activities is quite a broad subject, but that would, in that would include GP referrals, right. um, stroke rehabilitation courses, cardiac rehab, it's sort of quite an extensive um, health and wellbeing outreach mm -hmm. programme. Which, so it's, got, it's a lot one liner, but I think we could bring quite a lot of evidence for you to consider. It certainly fits the um, previous presentation yeah. very well. Um, and also, I would, if you don't mind, I'd, I would like to say one other thing on the care yeah. link, where we have the number of where it says number of calls per quarter. That I would like to that will show the number, but also the type and the outcome. I.e., how could the emergency services were called? What was the outcome? So that, again, it's a little. Behind, behind, behind those three lines, I think we can demonstrate how well the service is actually helping our more than most vulnerable residents. Mm -hmm. And I one I fear of talking too much. No. Um, thank you, Liz, uh, regarding waiver trainer services. It's something <laughs> Councillor Deanus and I have, have close to our hearts. It's a, it's a service that really works. The apprenticeship numbers are, are extremely high at the moment and improving but also offers the study program, which is for those um, youngsters that perhaps the formal education service <coughs> somewhat failed. So we also work with those sort of before even apprenticeships, preparing them for the life outside of the education system. So it would be really, I think, an interesting subject when we bring that back for okay. you to consider. Right, well, thank you. Okay, but we've now got a very big subject to... Now we've got Dennis yes. first. Oh, yes. Sorry, multi-mouse. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, was trying to I didn't notice you, Dennis. So I'm going to apologise. Um, coming down to CS3, um, I mentioned this to, um, to uh, Louise and you know, before. Um, I do like this aspect of a uh, quantitative figure mm -hmm. um, alongside a percentage because yes, 8.36% in the grand scheme of things is quite small, but 8,362 visits is not insignificant. And bearing in mind that we've got that information, um, a little statement as to the fact that we understand why that has come about, and could we have comparative figures with the other, because we're dealing with, you know, leisure centres, mm -hmm. and whether the answer there is the same for the other leisure centres or there's other factors. Absolutely, I'm um, certainly councillor, we can bring that more detailed background information and certainly show you so exactly what areas were were hit as well. It will be... But just yeah, it assures out. us, <laughs> assures me anyway, that you, you know your business. I know you know your business and everything, but it just assures us, I think, and that's quite an important factor. Absolutely. So, from that, would you like me to bring more information to the next meeting or circulate it? Without it, it being an onerous uh, overhead, yes, please. Yeah, or more I can circulate it with the notes of this meeting. Yes. It's not onerous, we, um, as part of the in depth review, I'm sure you remember, but we monitor these 
these um, attempt speakers in great detail on a monthly basis mm -hmm. and have already um, sort of gone back to the PFP, uh, our operator, to understand the more detailed so I can certainly circulate that information. Okay, thank you. Make sure I don't want to say anything else. Okay, right, we've got this very big and important subject of safeguarding policy. Uh, Andrew's now going to make the presentation. Thank you, Chairman. I hope that I won't take too much of your time on this. What I've done is to just prepare a few slides. Um, it all looks, all looks very posh. It says that I'm the lead safeguarding officer. I have been for about six weeks. I took over from the master, Mr. <laughs> Kelly Mills. And um, one of the things I've done is work through the new, safe doc, the new safeguarding policy for us. And I just want to introduce that to you. Hopefully you've read it. It's a, a fairly sizable uh, document and I'll say why that has to be in a moment. It's helpful just to see what the object of safeguarding is. There's a positive and there's a negative aspect. The negative is to prevent and reduce risk of harm to uh, adults, formerly known as vulnerable adults, now just simply adults at risk and also uh, children. Um, we've come across uh, modern day slavery and if you've read through the categories of abuse in the annexes there they kind of extend every week and sadly we find more and more things that we have to report and we have to safeguard against but also to support individuals to, ma to maintain control of their lives make informed decisions without coercion so that's the object of safeguarding while we have a policy why do we need one we, need, we have one because we have to uh, it's been set out in various Acts of Parliament and although as a council we have to have a policy and operate a policy, safeguarding is everybody's business because everybody needs to observe and be aware of where there is an issue of abuse and how to report that. It's a kind of strange thing because the County Council is really the statutory authority under the Government for safeguarding but all 11 of the boroughs and the districts in the county are partner agencies and safeguarding in our county is operated through two boards uh, specifically for children and also for adults we have representatives on both of those boards and so um, even though we operate a policy ultimately the statutory authority for safeguarding is the county council the new policy combines the two existing policies. We had one for children, we had one for vulnerable adults. Members thought it would be good to have one policy because there is quite a bit of overlap, even though different parliamentary acts will govern children and vulnerable adults. So we took the opportunity to bring both of the policies together and to update current procedures because they change. And I might just say that this policy will be a live document. It won't just be put on a shelf, be constantly looked at and reviewed by a, a safeguarding group and hopefully brought back fairly regularly to this committee to make sure that it's still fit for purpose. You'll notice I've underlined certain things and they're the things that I really want us to, uh, to consider and to embed. Um, to clarify the reporting process, what do I do as an officer or as a local member if I have a concern? The county uh, insists really that we do categorise all the abuse. One member said, do we really have to have all these pages of different kinds of abuse and indicators of abuse? We do, uh, because A, we need to know what to look for, but also that is what the county requires of us. And also the policy will signpost to different policies and strategies of other organisations that help us. Policy has been developed in accordance with the County Council's guidelines. Specifically, safeguarding training. Once the policy is adopted, then there'll be a, a, a new round of safeguarding training for officers and perhaps members as well. Our recruitment procedures are robust so that people that we employ who are going to have contact with children and with adults at risk will have enhanced disclosure and barring service recommendations. Um, there are, are details right at the beginning of the new policy on the team of safeguarding officers. It's very important, particularly that you as members know where to go if you have a concern, 
and the procedures that staff and members will follow with, if we believe that there is an adult <coughs> or child at risk. Now, how we meet our safeguarding obligations is very, very important that we get this into our minds. We do not investigate, neither do we diagnose, counsel, interfere, problem solve, or try and protect. We are not geared up to do that. And particularly as you look at all the different kinds of abuse, that is a very specialised task. If a child is being abused, how that is investigated and the necessary interventions put in place. What we do is to report and refer to the MASH. Now, you will have seen the MASH, I think, in the policy, and so we need to explain something about the MASH. I know that that is very small, but on page five of the policy uh, is clearly how we make a referral that relates to children or adults at risk. If an officer or a member um, sees that there is an emergency situation. It, it, if, for example, you hear or see a child being hit and abused in any way, then, then we ring 999. Any emergency situation, that is what we do. But if we have a concern, and the basic mantra is if it doesn't feel right, report it, then as members, you would, you would contact one of the members of the safeguarding team, one of the officers, and as officers, we would report that to the MASH, the Multi-Agency Safeguarding Hub. And that has been set up in recent times because there were a number of issues where people were referring, people were concerned, it was not joined up at all. So a hub has been formed that is the single point of contact for concerns we have for for children and adults at risk. The hub co-locates the key agencies, adult social care, children's social care, health and Surrey police. They are co-located at the county council and in various parts of the county. There's also a virtual team of partners that those agencies will pull in to make sure that everything is joined up. It did have a little bit of a shaky start in the MASH, it was known as the MISH-MASH, <laughs> but certainly I sit on the Surrey Chief Housing Officers Group and we get reports because a lot of referrals come through housing, as you'd expect. Our officers will make referrals through the MASH. And uh, that is now beginning to take shape with a new appointee to lead the MASH. And uh, certainly things seem to be working much, much better than perhaps they were. The aim of the MASH is to identify the need, the risk, the harm, accurately and facilitate the most appropriate and timely intervention. Abuse now and the indicators of abuse are so complex it is in, it's vital that you have a multi-agency hub that can pull in expertise from various other agencies to make sure that the, the actions that are taken are right. So that's just a very brief introduction with a few slides. I thought you might be interested to know actually councillors how many referrals this council made last year, and um, between October 2016 and now 40 referrals. And those referrals came from environmental health. Our, our officers will go into homes, they will see things that concern them, from housing and also a number from Waverley Training Services and the other few from other services. So it, it's not a massive number, but it's essential that we all know how we refer and to whom. And so in drafting the policy we've put that right at the beginning. So you just have to open the pages and see, okay, I'm really worried about this, there's something going on, 999. Actually I have a concern, I'm not sure, I'll refer that to a safeguarding officer if you're a local member, and then we take that on for you and refer that to the MASH and as officers we refer to the MASH. And as I say there will be a rollout of training again to refresh officers and members too perhaps. Uh, once the new policy is adopted. I will now shut up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? It feels more than six weeks actually, because <laughs> we've done so much work on this. Um, the first draft of this document, um, I think it's fair to say, confused me, mm. and I've probably got one of the better knowledges mm. that the council of my background, and I was confused. Um, and Andrew took this on and has completely revamped the policy 
Um, and our aim was to make sure it was a policy that you could understand. You don't have to know the nuts and bolts, but if you picked it up, would you know what to do, mm -hmm. i.e. make a phone call, how to refer it? So that was our aim, and I, and I do think it has been achieved. Um, we wanted a policy that was for staff, elected members, and members of the public. That was quite challenging um, to try and include everybody in that. But if, when you go through the document, you have to understand this is based on legislation that was, some of it was passed in 1989 and also refers to guidance in 2015. So some of the terminologies, depending on what they're talking about, may be slightly different. But what you can't do is change the terminology to make it into you know, today's terminology. So if you do reckon that we've seen it, different words have been used, it's because we've got to re reflect the legislation and the interpretation of the legislation. Um, you, you said about 40 people um, that have been referred. My point would be, if only one person is referred and this document ensures that their well-being is secured, then the document is, is achieved everything that's needed. Mm -hmm. I suppose one question, which I, I don't know if you want to have a discussion, because it's obviously a draft format, some people like documents being numbered, so each paragraph's a different number. We didn't do that initially because as people were putting comments in, we've obviously amended the document and it'd be too difficult. But that's just something maybe a view from you whether that makes a document easier. But I would like whoever's doing the, the minutes to, to congratulate Andrew because mm. this is one hell of a task we gave him to revamp. I think our document will be what other boroughs will follow. We looked at what they've done and I think this is streets ahead. Um, so I'm really personally grateful because it sits within my portfolio. I thought you've done a really, really good job and just my personal thanks and that of the executive for an absolutely cracking job. But I thought that question about numbering would be really good. Okay. okay. I certainly support the view that this is an impressive document and congratulations on the work you've done. In terms of numbering, actually, at least, uh, if somebody with at least page numbers, you can, re you can refer and it's page numbered, so you, you, can, you can easily find, you know, you're not stuck with, you're not stuck, it's not difficult to point to a particular point in the document. Uh, you're, you're talking more about paragraph yes. numbering. Yes. Yeah. yes. I don't know what the committee in general feels, but Possibly the final document would be useful to be paragraph number, but while it's going through various drafts, I'm not sure that's that, that's important. Yeah. But if that's what you feel makes yeah. an easier document, then we can at the final. In the final document, um, then we can do that. Yeah. I would, I would support that. Don't know what other members think. What do you think? Um, <coughs> I have a question, not about the numbering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I just please ask for a bit of clarification? Um, on page 66 of our, of our agenda, which is page 24 of your draft, Appendix 1, it says the 11 Surrey Borough and District Councils have a single representative nominated by the Surrey Chief Executive Group to represent them on each board. Are we saying there is one for Surrey? Or each district or borough has a representative. Each district or borough has okay. a representative. That's what oh. I hope to make. Yeah, we, yeah the, the statement is slightly ambiguous. We, we can clarify that, Councillor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yes. If you just put in the word each of a single yeah. representative yes. rather than. Uh, yes. yeah. Thank you. That's good yes. to hear because it was yeah. difficult to see how one one could cover all the buttons. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question, if I may, that, that you, you did cover the fact that you were planning training, for, certainly for officers, mm -hmm. possibly for members, that's important, and that will get the awareness out. How are you going to deal with the issue of the awareness to the members of the public about this? Because this MASH organisation seems to me to be crucial if, if it's collecting all the information and presumably distributing it out to people who need to know as well. Yeah, I presume yes. that's their role. I how, how the public want to know about it, it's even its existence and how they should... To be honest, I, I would welcome some comments from yeah. Calvin and Damien on that, because mm -hmm. this policy is for us as a council, right. officers and members. If, if members of the public have safeguarded concerns, they will ring the police, the social services or us. But I'm, I'm not quite sure how, mm -hmm. how it sits in terms of the general public. So okay. any, any comments from my fellow officers on that would be helpful. 
and Chairman, just just maybe um, to sort of build on that. So um, Andrew's absolutely right. If it's a member of the public, they will tend to go to a statutory service. If it's a, a parent, it may, they may go to a school. If it's somebody who's uh, being supported by the, uh, our health colleagues or social care colleagues, they'll go there. What, we're, what we've tried to do is make sure that our priorities around safeguarding are shared with those that we do business with, mm -hmm. so that shared with our main contractors, so they have a role, being our eyes and ears, to be able to see, for example, NEARS, when they go and visit people's homes to fix a tap, if they hear or see signs of neglect or, or, or abuse, whether it's between a, a adults or against an elderly relative or a child, that they know what to do, which is to come back and tell us and allow us to escalate it. Um, and also to our relationship with the voluntary sector, who again have a really important role mm -hmm. in getting close to our communities and making sure that they are empowered to, to deal, deal with it. So we're doing quite a lot already, but the main thing is to make sure that those statutory agencies, us being one of them, are able to respond to any concerns that the public bring to us. Thank you. So in terms of the voluntary organisations, are we going to sort of, in a sense, train them in our policy as well? And do, do we feel a response, this only came up at a pre-meeting, do we feel a responsibility for ensuring that the voluntary organisations are doing the right thing in terms of doing checks and so on? Because the point I was made at the pre-meeting is that um, a lot of the, some of these things may not be legally or formally the council's responsibility. If something goes wrong in Waverley, Waverley are going to get the blame, <coughs> whether it's their fault or not, if you see what I mean. Um, yes, I mean, it, it, it certainly is a requirement of the service level agreements we have with the voluntary agencies we work with that they have a safeguarding policy and they have proper procedures and that their staff, their volunteers have the appropriate checks and we can ask to see those policies. Okay. Mm. Okay. Nabil. Sorry, I'm sorry to you, but I'd like to ask. The, um, the community services and these um, meals and everything, are they made aware every time or are they report, do they have a part of that in the report and in the voluntary services? So, so, so Chairman, it, it, it's partly around us supporting their briefing and training, and in some cases, not every case, because some of those organisations have very good training arrangements, we will play a role in, in delivering some of that training and facilitating some of that training. But it's also about making sure that in our contracts, and remember, many of our contracts were signed many, many years ago, they're coming up for renewal soon, to make sure that those issues are built into our specifications and contracts. Some kind of inductions for the volunteers and everything, because it's, most of them don't read most most of the parts because they think of it as a small part. So if we make them more aware for that kind of uh, <coughs> what your workshops or something, yes, that would be lovely. And I think as you, as you started with saying, it, it, safeguarding is everybody's business. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. and, and they should know that they yes. are looking over it because some of the volunteers just uh, have a blind eye. Mm -hmm. and how important it is, they should have some kind of workshop or something like that. I mean, MIAs are a major ready. contractor that work in social housing, so they they have very clear safeguarding policies yes. and their operatives are trained in that council because they work not only for us but all across the country in social housing as well as other things. So the volunteers, MIAs must be, but yeah. volunteers as well, which are going for us of like mm. food and stuff, delivering food and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. Sorry. Just one thing, I really do appreciate um, the format here in the sense that for a concerned person their um, sort of actions to be taken are so clearly laid out mm -hmm. on just one, two, three sides yeah. of A4, yeah, not even good. going down to six point. Yeah, that's good. So it's wonderful and then you know the detail is behind. Okay. We have a recommendation in, in this subject that uh, that this committee recommend the adoption of the safeguarding policy for children and adults at risk to the council via the executive. Have we all agreed that that should uh, agree? Agreed. 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 I can Good. say with endorsement, it's very yeah. well done, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And the point about numbering coming up on the sort of final issue, is that something to be reported here or it goes oh, back to the yeah. minutes oh, again? They are considered together, are they, going forward? Um, yeah, so you have your minutes with the content in the minute and then the recommendation to endorse, but that's all part of it. Right. 
I'm just thinking about the, the readership. Uh, this says something about me, doesn't it? I'm not actually reading the minutes. So, uh, <laughs> we'll make it very clear what the observations are. <laughs> Bang my head. No, but, but all busy people. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, the next item is a presentation on, of, uh, on the community meal service. Community meal service update from James. Calvin. Oh, from Kelvin. Yes. You, so you, I will do my best Calvin. to come for Jane. You're not, you're not Jane. Yeah. Me, Jane, you talk. You talk. What was that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, um, this report is to serve as an up update members on progress to date of the Community Meal Service since it transferred from the Royal Voluntary Service on the 16th of January this year. Um, our partners, and that's you know, Brightwell's Cross Street in Farnham, Hazelway in Hazelmere, Rowley's in Crowley, and our own internal restaurant at Goldoming, yes. should all be con congratulated. They've all worked hard to continue the delivering of this service. It was quite a huge undertaking, actually. Um, and they've start, once they started providing the service, they've learned a lot of lessons as they've gone along. Um, there was a lack of support from RBS, it's fair to say, and to some extent our, our colleagues at Surrey weren't very supportive of this service, so it was very much left to the community, community's team and our, and our, our voluntary sector to, to really step up and take this on. Um, it's gone very well, the customer experience remains as consistent as possible across the borough, so what we've tried to do is keep the same prices, same criteria, the same images, that sort of thing, and the same training for the people that go out and volunteer. Waverley continues to support the service, not only from for the Godalming area, but also with some re revenue funding to help embed these services within the business models of the day centres. Um, we were pleased that um, very few, but most, all volunteers transferred across to the new service from the Royal Royal Voluntary Service, which was which is which was a concern at the outset. We weren't sure if that would happen, and we're really pleased that we're getting extremely positive feedback from the clients. They're, they're certainly embracing um, the fresh meal, the, the freshly cooked meal, and and, and so forth. Um, I'll come back to the to the annex on page 105 in a second. But um, the key challenges, obviously, is is the balance between cover and our costs. And, and affordability for the client. So we are currently just about to launch and I hope the members can take um, some copies, you know, of just some branding to really push the community meal service. So it's going extremely well in Farnham, with Brightwell's Gostry and, and Hazelway are, are doing extremely well, but certainly with Rowley's and in Godalming, it'd be great if we could increase um, client numbers because that helps to deliver the service. Um, we're, we're really pushing that hard from here on in. Um, and the only, only specific impact, obviously, to Wavy Borough Council is there's an impact on our own staff. So they've taken on extra, our sort of cafe restaurant team are now preparing meals earlier in the day to be, to be able to deliver it out. That's gone well. And also it's introduced a service <coughs> as part of the volunteering programme to some of our staff. So some of our staff are now going out and delivering the meals as part of their volunteering day. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and members, yes. And members, yes, certainly. Um, so we feel at the moment it's still early days, so you've got on Annex 2 on page 105 sort of the monitoring information that we've got. So it just shows that, you know, across the borough in the first two quarters from the 16th of January, we've, you know, delivered 10,283 main mills. You know, there was a thousand teas. You know, these. And I can't emphasise enough, and I'm sure members that are involved, these are the most vulnerable um, people in our society, and, and this is a real lifeline. You know, we use it as a way of, of checking on their, if they're isolated, to check they're okay as well as so the volunteers are trained. But even so, I think it just demonstrates that there's quite a lot. There's a, well, I'm not going to get too carried away, but it's gone extremely well, and we've been really, really pleased with how our voluntary sector has really stepped up and done such a great job and you know the figures are there for you and I'm happy to answer questions and go from there. Okay.
Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kelvin, uh, bearing in mind that originally Waverley did not anticipate having to assume the responsibility for godalming in the area, um, I know that, yes, it's wonderful that members are helping, mm -hmm. and of course it's always good when our, um, our staff our use voluntary, volunteer, yeah. uh, volunteering hours. What worries me is that this probably is not a short-term thing. You might be lumbered with it perhaps forever if this is going to go forward. Mm -hmm. Are you going to run out of volunteering hours, or what can be done? Um, I think the key challenge in and certainly members have a role to play as well as um, officers, is, is to promote more widely than just ourselves the um, opportunity to volunteer to, to deliver the service to the wider public. Um, we face perhaps a slightly harder challenge that we're less attractive to volunteer for than some of our day centres, but um, it's, it's a service that we feel internally that we need to grow to make it more viable perhaps then to talk to our voluntary sector within within the Godalming area with a view that perhaps it then becomes a business model that they see works. I think there was a nervousness um, about that when it, from the outset. You know, at the moment we can demonstrate even in this first six months we are covering costs. So the service is, is covering its costs. To some extent that doesn't take on board some of my community's admin time that they put in um, for it. But I know that the head of um, the, the, the restaurant the facilities is is keen that this is actually something that dovetails quite well with the service. So if you imagine the staff are in already preparing meals, it's fresh meals. So to add, you know, we're dealing circa Godalming is the smallest number, about twenty regular clients. So it's not a huge number, but it it actually dovetails quite well with the service. So they're in, they've just got to produce an extra amount of food. So. I think he sees it as an opportunity to actually be a business model that supports the staff restaurant. Now that is not the case at the present, but that's down to basically better promotion. But one hopes it will be self-sufficient. Yeah. And, and, and Chairman, this is, I think is one of the, the really important skills I think that Waverley has, is taking a service that's about meeting need, and Kel Kelvin's quite right, some of the most vulnerable people in our community but make it, designing it in a way that makes it sustainable. Mm. There isn't a huge cost that we all worry about eventually we'll run out of grant funding, but actually can sustain itself mm. for the longer term. And so I think utilising the, the council's kitchen, which has already got staff mm. preparing meals for lunches for mm. you know, as a staff restaurant, and utilising the community centres who are already making meals mm. for the people visiting during the day. So they already had the kitchen, they already had the mm. chef, they already had food being prepared and just adding some extra numbers mm. that hopefully means that they're able to start to generate some income to cover their sort of their costs is a fantastic way of making it work. Mm. And it was the ONS committee that helped shape yeah. the model that we have now implemented, or mm. Kelvin and his team have now implemented, that has proved to be so successful. Mm. But it does, I think as Councillor Wheatley said, it does rely on, on ongoing volunteers. Mm. Many of our volunteers are are, are uh, becoming older themselves will not be able to continue um, forever. We need to make sure that we've got the constant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, Dennis. Yes. Oh, I've got some coming up. Yeah. <laughs> so go on forever. Yeah. We, we could have a meeting regarding that. I've spoken oh. to Damien regarding that. Um, we are, um, our community centre is going to open up. They've got a big kitchen over there, which is for 30,000 people to mm. make in there. Yeah, no. And the community, the, the ladies are willing to help as mm. well, One day, the young ladies and everybody. So perhaps we could have a meeting with yeah. Damien mm. sitting in, in there Absolutely. and work it. Because yeah. Yeah. you will run out of volunteers and you will run out of uh, yeah. exhaust the kitchens and stuff. Yeah. So that will be ready in eight months anyway. Thank you. I'm one of those councillors <laughs> that stands in <laughs> and <laughs> helps out when they do have a shortage of volunteers. Now, I think one of the good things about the service is, I'm from Cranley, and I'm sorry, I hesitate to keep on pushing this, but we cover a very wide geographical area. Mm. And the last twice that I've actually delivered 
Meals on Wheels. It hasn't been meals, it's been one meal. And the journey for me is actually 12 miles. So it's brilliant that we continue to offer the service. And I think it's very important that one person in that area who's receiving the meals. Yes. But I think we have to recognise that it's not necessarily going to cover itself in cost wise. Mm. I don't charge for mileage, mm. but. Yes, um, yes. And, and in fact, you're, you're paying for the petrol yourself today. Yes. yes. Yeah. But I think it is a brilliant yeah. service. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I think it's excellent. Uh, it's terrific that Surrey withdrew £30,000 mm. of funding. Yes. and. We, we seem to have managed to carry on and to just do something better without the 33rd. Can yeah. I ask about the financial impact on Waverley? Because I understand that previously Waverley put in 30,000, the Surrey put in 30,000, yeah. now we've taken the whole thing over. What's the financial impact on our own finances? I, I no, we, we've always committed the, the 30, we uh, uh, Waverley committed the 30, to maintain the 30,000, so that okay. is still um, funds that we would right. support the service. You know, Councillor is, is, is quite right. It's a, it's a fairly costly service. It comes back to yeah. how Councillor Dina was saying about the safeguarding of one person. If you, yeah. that one person, yeah. that yeah. visit, it's it's well, it, yeah. is, it would yeah. be value, invaluable. And, and what the centres have seen, yeah, so there is that cost. Yeah. So talking about the finance, 30,000 is still there. We've also yeah. continued to help with the for emergency funds, with revenue funds, for capital, mm. for equipment, and that's something that Waverley is committed to, we're not walking, yeah. we're not walking away and you know this, what the, what the other areas have benefited from, this is helping, if it's delivered by the day centre and the people who know about the day centre, who know about CareLife, we are getting referrals through to mm -hmm. these people that are perhaps the one who's 12 miles, you know, this person who's 12 miles, trying to get them into the centre, that removal of isolation is obviously so yeah. another added sort of benefit with the day centres offering yeah. the service. So it's, yeah. yeah You've simply managed to make it break even without the Surrey 30,000 yes. sort of thing, yeah. which is excellent, absolutely excellent. And that is, that is down to our partners. Yeah. My team, have, and I, I would commend them, they've done a great job. Yeah. Let's not dismiss <coughs> how well this is, this is our this is our voluntary sector, yeah. Yeah. really, who we work closely with, really doing a great job in, in, in enhancing the service they had to offer, and they've all been really positive. So. That's been very, very encouraging. We're, we're faced with other similar problems from Surrey, aren't yes. we? They're withdrawing the grant funding they were giving to charities. Mm -hmm. They're withdrawing some of the funding to do with the sheltered housing. Yes. So we're probably going to have to be imaginative in yeah. these areas as well. Yeah, um, but it's amazing that they've done that in, in this area. Sorry. Well, thank, thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of random thoughts, uh, yeah, Kevin. Please. I'm really pleased to see that you've got some pl publicity to go out. I, yes. I remember reading up about the, the community's uh, uh, meals and there was a very good article in the, I think it was the summer of the version of, of yes, Wayne. Yes, yes. And yes. I, th I thought that was good and I thought, ha having seen that, yeah, we, we, we need some publicity out now just to keep, keep it boosted. And obviously yeah. you're, you're still looking for more clients to come forward. Absolutely, yeah? Yeah. yes. Um, you were talking about uh, referrals earlier. Um, do, do people like the, the GP practices know about us and co community facilities? Yeah, but they do, but that is exactly where we'll be going, Councillor, with the with the material, with the promotion. That's, that's good, because when I, I looked online to, to, to see yeah. how you got in contact, I thought, well, there will probably be quite a, a few people that are... Um, probably not capable of picking up the phone for themselves Absolutely. and um, may, may not have these these, these things, uh, either an, an iPad. Uh, so it's really promoting it within the community so that the wider community knows it's happening. Um, for th things like the price of the meals, uh, I think they're absolutely superbly uh, priced. I mean, when you compa compare to uh, the cook shop or Marks and Spencers, it yeah. comes in just at their, their level pegging. And ov obviously, the food's good because people are coming back for more. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're doing the, um, the, the teas as well, that's, <coughs> uh, I mean, it makes it a, a, a very good package. And the, the frozen meal at the... So, so you can yeah. have it uh, every day of the week. And, mm -hmm. and there are people that require that. 
And presumably the uh, the frozen meals, these are for microwave, are they? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. yeah, not yeah. heated before, so you can just heat them up. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I, I, I deal with a number of elderly people in, in my community, and they're, they're not capable, or no. shouldn't be allowed to, to work the other. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think kind of in the, your 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 spot on. It's it's well priced, but what we should what you get with this as well is that friendly face. Is yes. Well, let's not let's rule Dennis out. <laughs> 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 no, it, it, it is it's it's volunteers. That, so those people not only do they get a meal, but it's, it's good value. They have some reaction. They have some reaction. They have a conversation of yeah. that sort of meeting. So, and that's so important for for people that are home alone. And let's face it, there there are. I mean, we're sort of getting the public, I'm sorry, I mean, the public known, like yes. the fake fakes we have in every area, there should be a stall of some kind, so people get away and put in some money as well. Mm. That that would be an impact, because if the volunteers are free, they could have their stall up there, and every normal person, a layman, and, uh, finds out, and it will be like starting our own, uh, what you call, money coming in, and informing local people what is happening. I mean, they think Beverly is one of the richest uh, boroughs, but they are all people who need yeah. food, and somebody should provide that. Uh, and Chairman, probably the whole package of services from <coughs> care line yeah. to access to the day centres. Mm. Open a stall in every fake. Just, yeah. the whole just, package just to support. inform them, or they, we should have some strong volunteers who call people towards them, not standing over there, yeah. call them and make them away. I think Dennis wants to come back to you. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yes, no, well, of reply. <laughs> Don't worry, Dennis. I'll come back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, it is an important service mm. and absolutely fundamental to our priority of community well-being. Yes. Mm -hmm. So even though the future might have a few concerns because of funding and I mean I don't know looking into the future whether you feel very comfortable with the next 12 months but um, it, it's quite visible amongst mm. our, our population and so uh, yes promotion is still important and targeted promotion as well mm. it's, it's, we can't underestimate yes. that mm. mm. so we, because we're here we're here quite early in you know this was mid-January this was launched you know we we were very conscious of the team that we shouldn't start overly promoting it. Uh, we wanted to make sure we carried over the, the clients that sat with the RVS and smoothly dealt and made sure we could deliver the meals, the new service, I think. And, and that's gone, I think, better than, than, than any of us expected. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I would echo all the comments you're making. I think now we know it's embedded, that the, that the day centres can deliver, that our, <coughs> our own restaurant is able to deliver the meals. Now is the right time to start to be able to live up to a promotion push. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So now we can deliver. We know we can do it. Let's get the material out. Mm -hmm. So anywhere where you recommend that would be great. And my team will look to supply information. Yeah. Great. So, okay, yeah, sorry, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think this is.